Senate, and I'm joined by Senator Fisher and Representative John, and we wow. may have another legislator or two as well. And you know, the format will be for uh, both of the legislators to give us comments, and you can give us a time on that whenever you feel it's appropriate. <laughs> but then we want to actively listen as much as we can to see why you're here, why you took time in your day uh, to you know, share some concerns. And so we'll just start uh, by me giving a couple of introductory remarks. And uh, Peter, uh, Representative Fisher, and Representative John will do that. And then we'll go around the room. And if you want to say who you are, fine, and where you're from. And if there's maybe a particular issue uh, and so that you'd like us to, or you could give us some comments there, or, uh, but you know, to not go more than a few minutes, uh, we'd appreciate that. So, and, as well as everyone. And if there's something that's not covered today, or something that you'd like to talk more about in person, or, or both, just let us know, and we're happy to follow up on that. Uh, in terms of legislature, as you know, we started this week, and for the next 110 days or so through the uh, May 20 uh, adjournment date, maybe before, hopefully, we have number one responsibility to adopt a state budget. And it will be done, and we will not have a shutdown. We will work <laughs> something out together. It has to be balanced. That's required in our Constitution. It will probably be close to about $50 billion. And overall, the largest chunk goes to education, whether it's the E12 and then join with post-secondary, it's the biggest chunk. Followed by health, human services, which is getting larger, you know, taking care of, of our elderly, other persons with special needs in our community. And uh, this one fact that I was reminded of, next year there will be more people over 65 than under 18. And that doesn't happen. And the demographics have changed. The look of Minnesota has changed and so those are challenges that we'll be looking at in our budget uh, so putting together a balanced budget and there will be hearings whether it's on education transportation health human services our corrections system for guards uh, public safety obviously public safety is very important we'll be talking about uh, water quality and you'll be bringing up some additional issues as well. So that's before us. And the one thing I can tell you, nothing has been decided yet. And we'll be going through a process in the House and Senate of having committee hearings to get further input on any of the ideas. So nothing has been set, but over the next several weeks, that'll be the process. And it's very transparent. You can. Uh, get you know updates so not only through us but just by going to the Senate and House uh, website. There's information. Uh, all of our sessions are uh, on TV. You can get electronic clips, the bills that we introduce, the amendments, etc. It's all there. So that would be a, a quick overview. And, uh, let's, uh, and my committee responsibilities. Uh, I'm the uh, lead for E12. By lead, that means in the minority. I'm the lead for E12 public uh, education, uh, and that would include policy and finance. Uh, I'm also on the Water Commission, uh, as is uh, Representative Fisher. I'm the chair for the Senate on that. I'm a member of the Local Government Committee. And then finally, I'm a member of the State Capital Investment Committee in the Senate, uh, or what we call the Bonding Committee. So that would be some highlights. So I'll go to Representative Fisher, who will a little bit less than me, and I'm sorry if I went too long. And then Representative Jean, then we'll go around and have you introduce yourself about a minute or, or two, and then we'll open it up further. Good morning, everyone. I first of all want to say thank you, everyone, for being able to attend today. It's great to see so many people so early in the morning. It's great. It's, and it's nice to see people I've seen before and new people out here, so it's very exciting. Uh, very quickly, we want to let you know that uh, we did get underway this past week in the House also. Uh, I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing initially. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, first of all, what I'm going to be serving on in committees. I'll be serving on the Housing Committee uh, in the House. I'll be serving on the Environmental Natural Resource Finance Committee, Health and Human Services Policy, and then a brand new committee that we formed this year is a subcommittee on water, which I'll be chairing. 
Uh, and one of the things I want to kind of mention is uh, you've heard the Legislative Water Commission that was mentioned earlier. That is a bipartisan group that was put together uh, that Senator Weger and I authored, uh, put back in place about six years ago. Take a look at the water issues across our state on the long term. Try to be a proactive uh, situation instead of reactive. And one of the things that we found out, there's a lot of things that we've got a lot of common interest on. Uh, we've heard a lot of divisiveness and division, particularly at the national level. I want to let you know that on the water issues, we're really not seeing that right now in this state. Is uh, We've worked very closely with our Republican counterparts and have got some really good ideas that are going to be uh, coming forward out of the Legislative Water Commission. And one of the things that I'm going to be doing with my committee, and I was meeting with the uh, my counterpart on the Republican side yesterday for a while, go over what are the bills that we want to see, what are the things that we're all agreeing on that we can move forward, and what are the opportunities that we have out there that we can work together. And what we're trying to do is find the things that we can all agree on first, get the easy things done so we can lay the groundwork to do the hard work of the more controversial items because they want to have, you know, my Republican colleagues, they want to protect our water resource too as much as anybody else. And we want to do the same thing. Sometimes we just approach it from different angles. So it's trying to figure out where are the commonalities, where are the things that are very concerned to them because water issues in our state look very differently. It flows very differently whether you're in the northern part of the state or the southern part of the state. And a lot of times it's time to figure out what is the toolbox we need to help make sure that we're doing the right things in each region. And so that's the way that we're going to be approaching going forward. Uh, I'll kind of stop at that point in time. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone as we go forward and I encourage people to also keep in contact with us after today also. Thanks, Representative Chuck. Hello, hi, I'm Representative Tu Zhang. I'm represent uh, southern part of Maplewood, southern part of Oakdale, and a part of Woodbury and the town of Landfall. Uh, just uh, joined the legislature this year recently, just got sworn in on Tuesday, uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here to meet with everyone. Like uh, Senator Rieger had just said, nothing has been decided yet. We're looking to reach out to folks to do research to uh, get input from the community and to you know put before ideas that will encompass you know what the needs of our residents are. Uh, one of the committees I'm on is the Higher Education Committee uh, for for the things that this institution does. You know, many some of the bills that I'm looking to. Uh, help author or co-author has to do with career pathways, uh, getting folks uh, ready to enter the workforce to get the skills that they need. Uh, as you may know, throughout the state we have a workforce shortage, and so it's not that people don't want to work, but the, some of the skill sets that they have don't necessarily fit the needs of the companies. We want to keep uh, businesses here. We want to have a thriving workforce, a strong economy, and it's going to help be the backbone for achieving some of the things that we really want to achieve here in the state. So that's something I hope to really work on um, and you know work across the aisle and work with our colleagues in the Senate. And so you know we will pass a budget and hopefully no special session. And so no shutdown. <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to working too. Thank you, Representative Jong. And you know, and we all just had a, a meeting too on Wednesday. I didn't have the headline, but uh, it was a conference called One Minnesota, and many of the legislators were there just to talk about the future of our state. And you mentioned on the workforce needs, but within a couple of years, actually, we will have almost 240,000 vacancies that aren't filled and that we aren't prepared to fill yet. So what a challenge for higher ed and you know, the post-secondary pathway, so. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we'll go around the room and if you want to identify yourself, fine. Uh, and, and if you, you don't want to, you don't have to. And if you'd like to you know, say where you're from, if there's a particular issue or comment you'd like to share, and uh, we'll hopefully be able to do that within uh, within a reasonable amount of time. So. I'll start with you. Hi, um, hi, I'm Anna Ulrich. I am an intern here at Century College at the Resource and Sports Center. Um, and I came here to hear about the housing policy. Very good. Oh, my name is Emmanuel Washington. Um, I am the husband of President Millinder. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> And that's pretty much it for today. <laughs> Life is good. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jurzak, and I'm a counselor here, faculty member at uh, 
Century College. I oversee the Research and Support Center. And today I would like to talk about housing. And I also brought a guest. Uh, my father had brought me along to things like this, and it influenced me quite a bit, even though it doesn't look like it might. And <laughs> my guest is, can I say who you are? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's at Matoska International in, in fifth grade. Oh, I grandson there, so you, great school. Mm -hmm. And who's with you? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anne Gergela Bernier. I'm a Century alum, and I'm currently at Hamlin University, um, where I've co-founded an organization called the Future Brain Campaign, and we are an advocacy organization around basic needs and security among college students. And um, you mentioned 240,000 vacancies coming up in the workforce, and um, the Government Accountability Office at the federal level uh, released a report recently um, that said that food insecurity is leading to stopouts and dropouts. Uh, so we're wondering how we can head that off uh, by um, offering resources like housing, food, uh, to students from low-income backgrounds so they can make it to that degree completion and fill those vacancies. Thank you. Dallas? Uh, Dallas Pearson. Uh, I'm here obviously to film, uh, and the video will be available for those who want to look at it again on uh, YouTube channel, North Star Oasis. Uh, I'm here for a couple of reasons, to, uh, jobs in particular. Uh, the, uh, I'm losing a lot of friends because if they aren't bound to a current job, they're leaving the state. And I'm probably, I could probably count up to about 10 now in the last five years that I've left. Uh, tax conformity. Uh, we got vetoed last time. Uh, as a result, I probably had to fill out two state tax forms, uh, double, you know, doubling the the workload on that. Uh, the system you've got in place that just started uh, for tracking bills is inadequate. Uh, you can't track a bill. Uh, you can find it, but it's difficult. And even if you can find it, you can't put in what you used to be able to to actually track it, so you get alerts. Uh, so you, have, you don't know when the bill is going to be coming up before conference to be able to go into the committee. So those are a few of the things. Okay, and we're going to res respond after we go yeah. around. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, uh, Ken. Candy Peterson. I'm a city council member from North St. Paul. Um, when I was on the uh, door knocking path, I ran into a couple uh, of uh, guards at the uh, prisons, and that's very concerning for me. In fact, my neighbor retired early because of all the things that were going on. There just seems to be weekly or monthly some major thing, and I don't know, and it's got to be on the state level, obviously. Housing is a big thing for me, uh, affordable housing. Uh, North St. Paul, we have a uh, fair share, but I think it's important you know, for the county and the different cities to be involved, and veterans. Um, I want to do something for our veterans, too. So those are my three major things. Thank you. Hey, I'm Ben Jarman. I'm a new 62 board member, and uh, obviously I'm really into the education side of things, so I'm really curious to see what happens as far as education budget is concerned. Um, other, other than that, uh, just really into my community in North St. Paul, so thanks for inviting us. I'm Carrie. I have a student at Calvern, and I'm co-president of the Calvern Parent Teacher Group, so education is my big passion. Um, Judy Onfer, Education Project Manager at H2O for Life, um, and the lead coordinator of the Race to Reduce Project. Um, and we are um, very much um, interested in education and empowering youth to be the agents of change. Um, Senator Weger and Senator and Representative Fisher have um, long been a champion of this project. Unfortunately, we um, didn't get funding last legislative session, and I'm here to hopefully advocate um, for um, continued funding so that we can finish the project. The project is basically providing youth in grades pre-K through grade 8 every single year, vertically articulated with water quality education and empowerment to be agents of change. Kids are doing service projects, um, trying to influence their families and their communities to be able to protect our water resources. And um, we're in our fourth year, my early. Mm -hmm. awesome. Angelia Miller, uh, president of Century College. Um, thank you, uh, Senator John, for your uh, support on the Higher Education Committee. 
um, and your uh, comments about career and technical education is very important in Century, as well as all of our educational programs. So we appreciate all of your support. Senator Weger and Representative Fitcher, we always appreciate your support of Century and, and your knowledge and understanding of the high value of education as how education helps communities uh, thrive and families um, uh, go from uh, low economic, uh, socioeconomic conditions to um, livable wage and, and beyond. So clearly that's why we're in business as an open access institution and thank you uh, alumni for uh, being a part of Century and, and a graduate and then an advocate um, beyond that. Our concern is always funding for higher education. Um, it's always at the top of our list as costs go up and, and uh, enrollment is, is challenged either flat to down and is projected to stay that way. We have to sustain our institutions so that we continue to be a viable workforce because as much as we view Century as an educational institution, it is an employment, it's a place of employment for over 650 employees that, that we um, employ in this, in this region. So any impact to our budget affects our students in terms of our programs and services that we offer to them. And right now the burden of paying for those programs and services are on our students as, as, um, as tuition either remains flat or cannot be raised because affordability is always a problem. It is the cost of education that often uh, has, has students choose between having um, enough money to buy food in terms of food insufficiency. And uh, we're fortunate to have Michelle and joined by the intern this year to uh, help our students in the resource center where we have a food pantry and we have a lot of non-cognitive resources to help our students to grow. I will be at the Senate Capitol, I will be at the Capitol on Tuesday testifying before the Senate Higher Education Committee. Um, the House has asked us to only present a, um, a general overview of, uh, of the Minnesota state system. So I'm not going to be testifying, but I will be in the audience and present um, while you are on that committee. And, um, we will be highly involved in the legislative process and in this community to make sure that Century and all other higher education and K-12 institutions gets the support that they need because education is the key um, because it helps our community and our world thrive. Thank you. I'm Kathy Crea. I teach here at Century College. <laughs> and I live in um, Peter Fisher's district. Um, and I've got three kids uh, who have been through the White Bear Lake schools. My oldest, or my youngest is a junior this year. And my older children are starting to head into the workforce and it doesn't Job opportunities are um, kind of a challenge for them right now. Thanks for coming, Kelly. <laughs> Julie McGraw, I'm here from the Montemedi School District. I also I I live in Montemedi and um, just an area that we're You're on the school board. On the school board, yeah. Um, and. Uh, our school has struggled with special education funding and special education transportation reimbursement, especially in the last couple of years. And we're well represented, so everyone else can share their, their concerns. So thank you for your time. Good morning. My name is Lucy Payne. I am um, faculty at the uh, University of St. Thomas in teacher preparation. I am a Miami Dade School Board member, which we McGraw. And I also sit on the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board, um, Pelsby. So I work in the field of education in lots of different ways. And my you mentioned, just so everybody knows, the licensing of teachers is the board that you serve on. Right. So our, our board not only licenses teachers, but we look at teacher discipline. And we also um, approve units for the ability to license teachers. And so we work with all the higher eds in the state and the alternative pathways. And so from my Pelsby hat, I am most concerned about our alternative pathways and finding ways for especially um, students of color to find pathways into education because they are greatly lacking. I'm also very concerned about the, sh the great shortage we have in special education. We have a lot of people coming through unlicensed who are having to give what we call a tier one license to and put into classrooms who are not fully qualified to our most vulnerable students, which is very, very concerning to me and hits us very close to home in our 916 district. Um, 
So that's a concern. I agree with Julie's statements on the special ed funding <laughs> that, that we struggle with. Um, and then at higher ed, I'm very concerned, like Angela is, with the cost of higher ed. And when you're going to be a teacher, to go into higher ed, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> the formula doesn't work being a former math teacher. It doesn't really add up really well, <laughs> the amount you pay to go and then to come out to the salaries that we have for our teachers. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here. I have worked with Chuck and Peter in the past and, and appreciate all their help and support in, in the area of education. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jeff Colston. First of all, I'd like to thank the gentleman for, uh, for following this meeting. This is just terrific to get out of me, especially in a, even in a non-election year, right? Uh, anyway, I'm a, a long-time homeowner in Miami. I, I'm a very much a sustainability advocate. Uh, an active member of Citizen Climate Lobby, and I've been to Washington, D.C. four years in a row lobbying for uh, clean energy. Actually, CCL is a, a nonpartisan uh, uh, clean energy advocate. Um, but uh, very much so. One of the things that, with all the things going on, I still like to continue to uh, encourage everybody we need to put the, the climate, with everything else going on, you know, uh, the climate is, is not getting any better. Uh, but I just wanted to mention something I just found really interesting. Uh, this is only something you hear much of life. I found a YouTube video the other night from when I was in black and white TV, 1958, uh, Richard Carlson and Bell Science Series was on there. And they were talking there about climate. The whole thing was about climate. They were talking about this in 1958. But the, uh, the dirty energy industries have been trying to cover this up for over 100 years now. They've been doing uh, uh, subsidies for dirty energy companies. So anyway, again, thank you. Glad to be here. Robert Mankey from White Girl Lake. Uh, Three quick things. First, it's been mentioned, tax conformity is probably my number one issue. Uh, I've talked a lot about education here in the first few minutes. Uh, I'm a big supporter of STEM, but my hope would be that our higher institutions, as well as secondary, uh, do a much better job on the liberal arts side, with the history, English, and so on, because we need good citizens, and I'm not sure our institutions are putting out informed, solid citizens. And third uh, is a very broad, general one, but how can we have our legislatures, leaders, act as individuals and not as lockstep into two tribes? Nancy? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Nancy Livingston. I'm a resident of North St. Paul. I'm on the uh, school board of North St. Paul, Maywood Oakdale served with uh, Ben Jarman. We're so happy he ran. He's our, our newest member. I've been on the board since 2000. So um, I'm the grandmother on the board. Um, and I also work for Senator Weaker. Um, I was retired for a while, but now I'm, I'm working, you know, because there you go. Still got some game. So uh, thank you all for coming. You used to work here, too. And I used to work here. Yeah, I have very fond uh, uh, feelings about, about Century College. It, uh, their mission is, uh, is, is really important to uh, our state. So, thanks. Oh, Spencer. Oh, okay. Uh, Spencer Crows, Bloomington. Um, I'm actually uh, representing Fisher's legislative assistant, so if you come down to the Capitol, see us, uh, you'll be seeing me. So, um, <laughs> we're on the same floor this year, if you've been by lately, um, in the past couple of years, which we weren't. Um, so that's a uh, big positive. Hi, I'm Barb Dufferin. I'm the superintendent of Matamidae. Um, and as the new superintendent, truthfully, I came here to listen, um, and to hear what the community concerns were in more of a broader context. I certainly know a lot about what we've been talking about in education, and you've heard from us as well. So my, uh, truthfully, my intent of being here is to listen to the community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Scott Wagner, retired veteran. Uh, I'm now working for my master's degree in business administration, focusing on nonprofit organizations. Today I'm here to advocate for the Best Life Alliance and hopefully prevent a 7% budget cut to help the people with the health and human services. Maybe get some more information on what you guys are going to do to help help health and human services. I'm Jeffrey Morris. My, my wife and I took early retirement from 3M in 2018 to help take care of uh, our aging parents. Um, certainly taxes and uh, the, uh, the 
issues related to people that are retired in the state. It's a high tax state. That's obviously a concern when my parents live in a low, low tax state. Um, but more importantly, I'm a licensed professional engineer. I'm, I read health, the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the state. And if there's hopefully, if there's any issues um, where we're trying to de defy the laws of physics or science, hopefully I'll be able to hear to, to give you uh, uh, <laughs> someone that's licensed in the state on engineering and to, to help you uh, understand those highly technical issues with infrastructure, water, some of those things that um, that are very complex and, and have, I have an insight on. Um, Minnesota Society of Professional Engineers. Hi, I'm Kelly Snyder, and I'm from Matamidi, and I met with both of you last year, and it was on the um, standards for senior living, and I know that I have passed, and then I got put in the bill, and then the bill got vetoed. And my question is, how much of the bill that got vetoed that had so many things in it, are you going to be resurrecting some of that stuff this year? And did I miss that so you can bring that back, because I know there were several things that passed, but it got all packaged together, and I understood why the veto happened. And I'd like to hear from you about what's going to be resurrected and doesn't have to be started to, to, to scratch, because a lot of things just went on the floor. My, um, my name is Keith Downey. I'm the owner of Clean and Press, and I volunteer my time as the president of the Minnesota Cleaners Association. Um, and I'm here for the most boring thing ever, which is to talk about the Dry Clean Fund. Uh, which is what the industry ships in to help clean up a lot of these legacy sites that are out there. And the fact that um, we've cleaned up a lot, roughly 60 sites, spent $13.5 million of our own money to clean that up, but we've had dry cleaners that about 350 of us in 95 when the funds started putting money in, and now we're down to just over 100 in the entire state. And the hardship that the, those small businesses are feeling as far as that amount of money they have to put into that pot has been ever increasing, especially over the last three years. Okay. Well, thank you very much again for being here and sharing your thoughts and some comments. And we're going to react and perhaps engage a little bit more on you know, some of these points. We'll try to get to each of the points the best that we can. Um, I like first of all on the unfinished business that was in the bill that was vetoed where and it was a thousand page bill and that should never happen again where we have a, a thousand page uh, you know, bill with a whole lot of ideas uh, many of them good ideas yes, by the way and and, so, right. yeah, and so and on that in terms of items that were in that large bill there's been an agreement I believe by Speaker Horkman and Majority Leader Gazelka charge of the Senate, those two have said, let the committee chairs, uh, you know, we have various you know, committees in each body, and they've said, let the committee chairs meet uh, to discuss those uh, items, especially those that are non-controversial, like the 7%, uh, you know, taken away for those uh, providers, and I, I was just at some group homes, and you know, where people, are, you know, you're trying to hire at you know, $12 an hour, or a, a little bit more, you want to stay competitive, and for these people, that uh, you know, makes you cry. Uh, and you know, that is not Minnesota to have people treated this way, where they're actually rolled back. And so it's an example of something that I would assume is going to be <coughs> reinstated. But what? On, and there's many other things in school safety. You know, there were some provisions that were agreed to. Are they going to get it out sooner, though, or are they going to um, wait till everything in May? I, I would hope um, they could get some of this stuff signed. The, the, Not well, at least, at least, at least in the plan in the house is to get those stuff out. A little bit sooner. The, the target is, is yeah. going through a trend fair with the processes because the last thing we want to do is get another large bill out there and run into problems. So it's trying to figure out what is the process that people can still see what's going on. In the House, almost a third of the people are brand new, so they have not been exposed to any of these issues before. So in fairness, we've got to at least have the hearings so they're able to hear that. So uh, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Uh, I very much understand the important goals that are out there, but we want to try to. Uh, have a process that we still have transparency, but try to move it along quick enough so that things that we all agree on can get done quickly 
and may have us look into new processes, how we get things through. Uh, one of the things that's been talked about is there might be a consent agenda that might get added in the house where if everybody agrees on some bills, and city council, a number of city councils do this, where they have things that everyone agrees on, they put it on the list yeah. and they do it. We've never done that. So one of the things that we've learned from last time around is we've got to re the process. One of the things in the house we've got is a committee at looking at legislative reform. Should we be doing it differently? And I can tell you the committee structure we have, while well, our committees, there's smaller people on them. And one of the things they've felt is that if we can break it up a little bit more, we can have more work done the committees, people working together to get things done. So there are some things that are evolving along those lines to try to address what got left over from last year, but also setting a pace of how to do it a little bit better this yeah. time around. Okay, and, and keep reminding us, yes. uh, leadership that's not moving along, uh, I have met with you know, the chair, for example, for E12 Policy and Finances, Senator Carla Nelson. We talked about school safety, some of those items that were held over in, in the veto, and there seems to be bipartisan agreement that we need to act on these. So. Uh, the, the process where bills are introduced and in Dallas on a concern uh, uh, you know, that you're not able to track the bills um, they were just introduced on Thursday and so there, there hasn't been you know much movement on that but uh, for the Senate anyway if you call the you know, you know the majority leader Gazelka's office or Cal Ludeman the secretary of the Senate uh, regarding you know the tracking but you know no one has brought that to my attention I imagine in the house in the House, uh, what they're doing is they're moving it by committee report as they're doing memos from one to the other. From my understanding, the way it's going to move in the House is, uh, example, when a bill comes to me, when it goes to uh, the Environment Committee, is a memo will be sent out and that will be posted so that people will be able to see when it's going to be heard, you know, uh, in for the next committee. So uh, a bill on uh, a water issue will go for me. I'll refer to the Environment and Natural Resource Committee. Before they can hear it, they're going to have to post online as to when they're going to have it. We have to post uh, two to three days in advance of when we're going to be hearing bills so that people have an opportunity to see what's going on. Uh, that sometimes will get uh, sped up a little bit. Uh, sometimes if there's a crisis out there, we need to respond to bills a little bit more quickly, in which case there's usually bipartisan support. Those kind of uh, instances sometimes, the times may be shortened up, but there will always be at least a 24-hour period to be able to get the notices up of when the meetings, uh, when the bill's being heard, and for any amendments that might be uh, submitted beforehand. Uh, yes, just, just you know, my the concern is that used to be you get an email alert on the bills. I believe that part is now dysfunctional. Oh, okay. that's okay. that's the what was brought to my attention anyway. Okay. And, and for the house, uh, our website has changed, but the layout is is similar. But the the, the layout of it, uh, there there has been changes to the website, uh, updates into some of the graphics, uh, tracking. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get staff to ch check on the email alerts. There, there will also be individual email alerts from our own individual offices too for certain bills that uh, we will be working on. Yeah. On education, uh, that is the largest part of the budget as I mentioned earlier. It's over 18 billion. Uh, yeah, you, know, you have a right in our constitution to education and are, there's a lot of discussion as to how much additional will be invested and it's uh, critical to uh, the training of our workforce and so the thought is first we need to get our uh, revised uh, you know, budget information in place and while the governor I believe will uh, present a budget on February 19 or so it will be a state of the state and, and then we'll get the uh, what the actual forecast is you know they've been giving estimates but just you know, what is the the surplus how much is already uh, booked for inflation etc but once we get you know, the money that we feel we have then there will be what we call targets for each of the spending divisions and uh, you know the education is probably going to have the largest target uh, it will be uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in increase. They're not going to cut that. Um, they're not going to cut corrections where on guards, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the new you know, commissioner, uh, Schnell, formerly Maplewood Police Chief and others, you know, they're very aware of the need to look at staffing. But there will be targets for each of these areas for education. 
uh, I, you know, there will be, and I've, I've put in a number of bills, that, and that's all on the website. If you want to see them or to get the newsletter, we'll have more. But the formula, uh, people you know, get a, a set amount uh, based on uh, student count, and then it's weighted on various factors on uh, your student population. Uh, as to whether it's going to be uh, one percent and another percent, it's a two-year budget, uh, or two and two, two and one, or three and three, whatever. Uh, each time you increase that amount, it's much more. Uh, if we did a three and three, for example, it would be five hundred and forty million dollars. Um, and many have testified that that will just put us at an equal basis as to you know what we're planning on. Uh, but there's many other areas as well, and if uh, special education, as you know, you have a right to an education, and you know, in the special needs area in 1975, I believe, you know, Congress uh, approved the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So you have that right. The uh, federal government was going to help uh, provide 40% of the cost. Well, it hasn't, and so school districts in meeting this. Uh, responsibility and challenge uh, have found that they have not had quite enough money through our special ed funds to do it so it's had to be taken out of the general fund meaning it's cross subsidized and over 800 million uh, it's mind-boggling many districts they wouldn't have these shortfalls if we adequately funded special ed there, I do have legislation to provide additional funding for special ed, the Association of Metro School Districts, and others are you know, talking about the importance of this, and we would phase in uh, money to help do that. Um, I, it's, it's a matter of how much is our target going to be for education. So much goes for formula, so much will go for special ed, and in addition to special ed for you know, the actual money, there's also, you know, just the continual concerns we get about paperwork. Yes, you, you need to be accountable and develop a plan, and every parent has that right, that expectation of a plan being developed for their child. Uh, but teachers and parents as well have talked about, is there too much paperwork? And uh, so there uh, should be a number of bipartisan recommendations coming out. Uh, the Senate, uh, Senator Pratt uh, had a, had a committee over the interim and we will have proposals addressing that on uh, the paperwork and uh, you know, hopefully that can be worked out and make it a little bit easier uh, so and, and then just the recruitment for special ed teachers has been a real challenge it's it, there's a shortage and we'll be talking about that as well so I I know in most districts is concerned there will be a number of proposals addressing it from the money standpoint from a policy standpoint i mentioned formula uh, school safety briefly uh, we provided some funds last year in the bonding bill for this uh, you know for districts that applied for additional uh, funds to help on um, student security safety but uh, there were so many applications that they just ended up doing it by lottery and it should not be based student safety and we were reminded that it, you know at North High you know at the big lock at the lockdown and just the chilling effect of this you know, that security how important it is and this was internal and so it gets in prep to you know more counselors uh, you know, others that can address, help address mental health needs because a lot of times there are red flags and alarms that are going off so we We'll have additional funds, but how much it's going to be will be determined. Um, there, there's other areas in education, and uh, maybe if, I, if Representative John would want to talk a little bit more about the importance of higher ed and the <coughs> secondary, because ultimately the goal for our uh, E12 system is to prepare students for that post-secondary opportunity, career, job, military, but so that you're prepared for that next step. And, you know, additional thoughts that uh, as you're yeah, that getting and ready. Also, like adult education too. Uh, yeah. For people that are shifting industries or shifting career paths, you know, we want to have 
something in place for that too. Um, uh, there was a mention about the teachers that increased teachers of color. Uh, so in 2017, you know, there were a list of proposals for to increase teachers of color. And so, you know, we, some of our uh, items were in the the bill that was in the past that was vetoed, and so we're definitely going to be including some more uh, more for that. I know there are four colleges that we have incubators for uh, having teachers of color, and so there's I think we got less than a quarter of what we asked for, and so that's something we're, that we're definitely going to be looking back at and uh, trying to increase. Uh, you know, bring teachers into the workforce, but also giving them enough resources so that they would stay in the in the teaching profession. And also, I think it goes back to, you know, how much are we as a state going to, you know, support our teachers, respect our teachers, and respect the profession. Uh, can't expect students that goes to a college or private college and expect them to live comfortably with a teacher's salary. It doesn't work in certain districts. And so we're, that's something that uh, I'll be looking at. Um, there's a mention about the prison, the correctional facilities. Uh, it's a tough job. Uh, we're, we'll be touring a couple of the facilities. You know, you, you can't expect people to stay in that profession with such such a low wage. And so it's something that we, we really have to look at. Uh, but they have like 50 openings right now. Yeah, 50 they openings yeah. that they cannot fill. And so... How many do they employ? I don't even know. Oh, yeah. Some of them are getting out early because of the. Yeah, uh, I, early I don't have that number. We can get that. Yeah, I would like the job. I imagine it's a couple thousand or so, but okay. I have to get that. Yeah, but I think 50 vacancies at once is something that was yeah. unprecedented because uh, 50 that they cannot fill. Uh, and so uh, the wage is not enough, the safety concerns that they have. Is is lacking funding for certain security measures for those facilities itself is not enough and so uh, it's something that we're looking to put more money in um, but uh, I think there's a mention a lot of mentions about housing uh, it also goes towards the environmental piece I know we talked with the city of Woodbury uh, they mentioned something about uh, a bill that's going to allow for more condensed housing, so to, to allow for, uh, you know, uh, a very multi type of housing that would increase density. That way, aiming at uh, eliminating urban sprawl so that we, you know, use up less roads, less uh, traffic congestion, and some stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, we're battling that out here in the first ring of suburbs, and so um, I think it goes towards some of the transportation stuff yep. too. Yep, Peter on housing and transportation. Right, I'll uh, yeah. hit on housing. Uh, first of all, my background is I've spent uh, almost the last 12 years working in North Minneapolis at the homeless youth shelter. So the housing issues are something that I've been very familiar with going back many years. Um, some things, uh, just some real quick stats is when I first started doing this 12 years ago, there were approximately 1,600 kids on the street any given night that were homeless. That number is now up to 6,000. Mm -hmm. So we've got a problem that uh, has escalated. A lot of it happened after the housing crisis that we had in 2008. Uh, a perfect thing that, as an example, that would happen that time, there were people who had jobs who were paying the rent. Uh, their landlords uh, were not making the mortgage payments. So what happened is the properties got foreclosed on the people who had been making rental payments all the way through were forced out of their homes. So here you've got people who made their payments, who were being employed. This happened quite a bit in North Minneapolis. Uh, we had staff that fell into this, where they lost their homes. The problem is they could not get another place to rent. Even though they had the money and they could afford it, they were getting turned down because they had no reference from the previous land landlord. The landlord, I'll call them slum lords of these guys, because they had no responsibility at all, just bailed. So they stripped the equity out, People were left behind, and as a result, they were on the streets with their kids, and the kids in the family unit started to get broken up trying to find places to live in. That is something that's had impact that's still running, at least through northern Minneapolis, is because most of the properties that were then bought up by companies outside the state of Minnesota, and those rents for those prices now are between $1,800 to $2,500 a month. 
and all that equity now is owned by people not here in the local, invested in the local communities. Uh, some of the things that we need to know as we're taking a look at the housing thing is that there are some very real disparities that are occurring out there. Is right now in the, in the housing area, uh, when we take a look at our people who are homeless, when you fix for income and everything else and make comparisons across, is that if you're a Native American or a person of color, you are six to eight times more likely to not be able to get housing than if you're Caucasian. And that's after fixing for everything else. So there's something kind of implicit bias, unconscious bias that is going on that is preventing people from getting in. I've seen this on a regular basis. I uh, was at a meeting a month ago where I was talking to my colleagues on this, is that there are instances where uh, one of the frustrations that we have is we're providing supports to our youth who've got kids getting into housing is that the process to get into housing is much more complicated. Is what is occurring is when we apply, they expect first months, last months, and a couple other deposits. So the first payment they have to make can be anywhere from two to four thousand dollars to be able to get in. Now somebody who's already homeless doesn't have that kind of money to be able to make the down payment. So now we've got a barrier that they can't get into. My daughter, when she went into the apartment that is over here in Maywood, didn't run into those at all. It was just having a deposit that was a few hundred dollars. You know, so there's a disparity that's going on there. That is very real for people who are don't have the means out there. Another thing that runs into problem is that so often is that uh, the youth that we work with, uh, when they run into uh, a small bill of even a couple hundred dollars, they don't have anyone to turn to to help them because their network is in poverty. And an example of that is uh, when I was first getting started, uh, I had a little car problem here and there. I was able to turn my parents, my parents had that. I always had somebody in my network that we could turn to. The problem is the networks that so many of the youth that we work with, so many of the people that we work with that, that have been poverty trapped for so many years, the entire network doesn't, can't come up with $200 between them. That's another problem that I was out there that is very real. They're living hand to hand, uh, day to day in many situations. And a lot of it comes down to, you have heard that a lot of the people I've talked about have had jobs. Most of the people that are homeless out there have jobs and have family. It's just the jobs, the full-time jobs, do not pay enough to be able to pay, make sure that they can pay their housing and also be able to put food on the table at the same time. And so you've got those kind of situations that we're facing. So the big question is, how do we start addressing some of the problems out there? Some of it is more uh, is some of the institutional things that we've had over time. Uh, there were large areas in Minneapolis over the years that used to be redlined where you, they would not make bank loans out there, and so as a result, people were not able to buy and were trapped in rental situation. It goes far, as far back as during uh, World War II. After World War II, the greatest thing that helped people who were uh, veterans was they had the GI Bill, but the GI Bill was specifically limited to only those who are Caucasian. So if you were a, a person of color who served in the military in World War II, you could not take advantage of the GI Bill to go to college. You could not take advantage of the GI Bill to get your house. These are the things that were systematically set up over time. And those are some of the policies that still sit out there. Our fair housing policy that was set by the federal government doesn't have any penalties or teeth. So people, while the policy is out there, there's nothing to enforce it or there's no penalty if you don't follow it. So it's taking a look sometimes at what are the policies that we've instituted over time. The big thing that is also taking a look is we've got so many people who are homeless now who don't have uh, housing, who've got youth in tow, and youth who have youth. That is one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing in trying to find out what is the way to try to address the housing situation. One of the nice things is that uh, in 2013, 2014, we started beefing up the Homeless Youth Act. Instead of putting out only a million dollars every two years to address it, it went up to six million dollars and then seven million dollars a year to start addressing it. So we've got more support networks out there, but we're finding the big part is that the lack of the affordable housing that's being built right now. Most of the housing that's being built is in the higher income ranges, plus in some areas, uh, what is happening is where it was a, uh, affordable housing or housing that was set up for low-income people. Uh, new landlords have bought it. Uh, they rehab the facilities, eject everybody who was there, and now it becomes higher income. And as a result, no replacement housing was built at that same point in time. And that's the biggest thing that we're seeing. An example is along the Green Line. A lot of the housing along there used to be very affordable. A lot of the housing that is going in or the housing uh, units that are being transformed are going to very high housing but there's been nothing put in place to make sure that as the low income housing that was out there, the affordable housing, 
that was not replaced anywhere. We have to start targeting monies to make sure that as we're losing affordable housing units, that they're being built somewhere else that also has the relation to transportation. Because it does no good to build it out here quite early and they don't have the bus system to go with it back and forth. Uh, one of the things that the local chamber here has been very vocal on, I met with them uh, a week ago Friday, is they want to see better transportation at the Northeast Metro for a couple of things. Number one, to make sure that in these kind of situations, when people are in affordable housing, that they've got the bus system to be able to get them from where they are to the jobs that are out there. And more importantly, be able to collect the jobs that they have to people who want good paying jobs but don't have the car reliable car transportation to be able to get them there. So they kind of wrap around. And eventually where this all wraps around to is in education. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenge that we have in education right now is the mobility of students or the lack of stability. It's really hard, and I've seen this with the kids that I work with on a regular basis. It's really hard for them to be able to study in school on a daily basis and concentrate when they're hungry when they go in and not knowing where they're gonna be sleeping that night when they leave. You know, when you hear that there's 6,000 youth that are homeless at any point in time, and in this area right here, on any given night between the school districts, whether it's Montemedi, Roseville, uh, uh, White Bear Lake, we've got over 500 kids who are homeless. Those are just the ones that identify. Most kids who are homeless don't identify and don't stick out. And until we start underlying some of these basic problems, we're going to continue having the challenges in our education system. Some of the schools that we've worked with. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Really good. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm a little passionate about it. Can I, uh, since when we did our introductions, I just said my name and we'll read um, I do want to share with the group here that um, I'm part of a coalition that's working with the Wilder Foundation to uh, address legislation for exactly that. Because uh, you mentioned North Minneapolis, and I think a lot of times people think North Minneapolis, that's where it's going to be. Um, in the last, I think it was, um, I got mine here. In the last, uh, it's quadrupled. Homelessness in Ramsey County Suburban, so this is not including downtown St. Paul, has quadru quadrupled from 189 homeless students in um, 2007 to over 800 just in Ramsey County Suburban. And working in the Resource and Support Center, every day I have a student I'm working with that's homeless now. When I started 20 years ago in community college, maybe once a year. And they are sleeping in their car. They are, I mean, all of this is right here in our community and it's in Matamidi. So you're not, you know, for those people who don't think it's there. Um, so yeah, uh, the legislation is called Homes for All and we're working with legislators and I know we met with Senator Isaacson and he's happy to support and maybe even author it. But it is, it's a lot of the education, can, I mean, our students do it, they're amazing. I know that, um, if you don't mind me, Ann has struggled in the past. Now she's amazing. She's been um, authored in the Post, the Washington Post, for the work that she's done. So it's like this is potential that is getting lost because people are suffering. Um, young people are suffering. Families are suffering. So um, even though I love higher education, I know I can't do my job until people are feeling like they have a place that they can lay their head. And I would add one other thing. Um, if a family member is a wheelchair or if there's any type of ADA accessibility or FASD where um, a family member damages the rental property, um, with waivers you can only get $1,000 for damage destruction. And so a lot of times, you know, if you have a child or an individual with a disability or may need a roll and shower and with our elderly also coming up, um, that's a really important aspect too for for the homes for all and and for our youth because a lot of them you know it's a we need to accommodate for disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, very eloquently stated. And I might add too a number of churches are part of coalitions and uh, synagogues you know, are strongly advocating this as a part of their faith yeah. and that we have a moral imperative to act. So it it's clearly on the agenda and. We'll be looking at you know, the rollout to the administration on how this all gets balanced. So some quick responses on some of the other items on tax conformity. I fully expect that we'll have you know Senator Chamberlain as the uh, and the Senate putting together a bill and, uh, and uh, in the House uh, Representative Marquardt. We do it at Dallas. We're not. We're going to have to follow up individually on that. The, there is an administrative ruling already in the department that says you can decide whether you want to go standard deduction 
uh, or you know, itemize and and I expect that's what will people do, assuming they can file and start filing their federal later uh, this month. But, uh, but the federal, the federal, uh, uh, you know, conformity that's in place, but uh, it's on the agenda. We're just waiting for those proposals to come forward. On veterans, whatever we can do, the you know, Century College has a great program with the Veterans Resource Officer. Uh, I have my own daughter who uh, is Iraq vet and. Uh, was able to get her education through St. Thomas, to get through the master's level, and, uh, you know, and serves veterans. I get daily reminders of the challenges and needs, and that we never forget them when they get here, especially with uh, mental health issues. We have a number of things in, in law now for uh, hiring practices and uh, homeless issue to reach out. That we have a great deal of bipartisanship in working uh, you know, to address that, and so whatever we can continue to do on that. Uh, on the cleaner issue, uh, Peter, I don't know if there's anything about you with your water committee or you know, that might address the, uh, I didn't know there was a state cleaner. Right, there was, a, and I heard that. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sure. I, there was something here this last session, I can't remember what yeah, it was. Yeah, it was basically trying to mirror the petrol fund as far as uh, right. controlling costs, but it's not enough, you know, so we're just, we just were asking for audience to come in and meet you guys sometime and talk about it. That oh, yeah. doesn't need to be discussed very early. Right right. so. There'll be a number of proposals on uh, the sustainability, uh, you know, on the environment for increasing the expectations as to what we can do to be better, you know, energy uh, conservators. And I, uh, we can talk more in terms of what is being proposed by the administration and those of us, but uh, you know, climate change is real, and we uh, will have a number of proposals, and uh, many of them will have bipartisan support. Um, anyone like to that hasn't had a chance to say anything that has that they'd like or, to say right now? Or we didn't cover something you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I think uh, yes. I'll jump on that real quick. One of the things I want to mention: uh, we want to free up money. Uh, Firm labor and uh, clean energy being can be cheaper. Uh, it's electric buses. It's just barely starting to get on the rising. I drove a school bus for seven years, and the schools said transportation is a tremendous cost in education. And I think we're burning a lot of it up that we use for these special needs and stuff. Yeah. Electric buses, we need to be a high priority. Yeah. We're replacing buses all the time anyway. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> As long as our infrastructure is capable of handling any additional load and we're not importing fossil fuel energy from somewhere else to, to justify an electric vehicle or whatever, we have to make sure we have a good infrastructure in place. Yeah. And I think there's like some um, some project group up in St. Cloud with the electrical buses in St. Cloud. Mm -hmm. and so I think they're looking to incorporate them into we are some of the uh, vehicles that they're using now. Yeah. It's still a ways off, but it's, it's uh, I think it's in the right direction. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I have a question about higher education. Do we have an economic impact statement of our education system here in the state of Minnesota to help us justify? Yeah, and they usually provide one during our, uh, during the pre overview of higher ed. And so I'll have it on a web our website. Oh, what day you just <laughs> <laughs> our impact in this community right today. What's the return on investment? Millions. That's great. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, it's our future. And, but uh, and those questions are asked. We have various metrics of accountability to that. We ask them. They're meeting with the business community, talking about are, are there real jobs? Are they going to be there? Etc. And um, I think one discussion into higher ed is so during this campaign season, we were door knocking. You know, the battle, election back battleground was in the suburbs. And so, um, you know, talk, talking with many different families in the suburbs about education and higher education, uh, I think there's um, a certain stigma that comes with it. Uh, I can certainly tell from personal experience, you know, my parents are refugees, and when they got here, they were, by God, you will go become a doctor or a lawyer. So I went to law school. but. You know, working in the community, working with nonprofit organizations, not every 
child wants to go to college, not every child needs to go to college, not every child can afford to go to college. And so we have to let the students know that there are other opportunities out there. There are good labor union jobs. There are other opportunities to get an education that doesn't require a PhD or a JD. And so uh, have, having those resources available and letting people know that these jobs do exist, you can make a good living. And so eliminating that stigma and putting you know resources into school counselors, um, having career pathways that are that make sense to different individuals and uh, you know really tackling that because I think student debt is a real issue that we're going to have to face further down the road and I think what we can do now can alleviate you know some of the negative impacts that I, that I think it, it will have because some students walking around with forty to fifty thousand dollar debt and I think Minnesota is probably one of the highest with uh, student debt and so they're going to have to pay that money back one day. And so uh, I think with these high tuition costs, student student loans, I think it's something that's unsustainable for the long haul. So we need to find solutions. I think and I think it starts here uh, in places like Century College uh, where we can offer our alternatives for our working force and find a cost efficient way to uh, funding our your know, next generation workforce. Work. I think uh, co career pathways to like PCAs having the ability to PCAs to do like PD training or our nutrition. There's a lot of school positions out there with special ed or like nutrition services or these random things that also need career funding and they need help because school districts will do PD for their teachers, but me as a child or my child with special education they see the para more than they see the teacher we need to make sure these people are educated or get into a pathway where it is um, a feasible for them a living wage yes. i would like to um, make a differentiation and that is is that two-year colleges such as century of public two-year community college is not the same as a path of one to four the path of one to four is your high cost and all your debt. That is not Century College. Our, co our costs are as affordable as they can be given that we still have to operate our institution every day, pay our employees, have all sorts of resources for our students. But it is not that one to four debt. It is not the one to six debt. It's not the one to eight debt if you're getting um, you know, a PhD. And what we're doing better, and I want everybody to understand this, we are partnering with our K through 12 uh, superintendents um, and making sure that we align our courses and our pathways, give cl uh, clear information. We're working with our chambers to have career and technical education days where um, employers come in and we outline how much education they need, how much training they need, where they can stop out and opt back in to make sure that they have that information going forward. We are extremely cognizant about the cost and the debt that our students take on to get through our higher education institutions. So we're working with our foundations to make sure, whether it's at uh, the K through 12 or the higher ed, so we can supplement that, um, that cost and, and mitigate those gaps so the students don't leave our institutions with a lot of debt. So I, I just caution us not to lump all of higher education together and have one message. Let's have a separate message uh, because Century is a comprehensive community college that offers liberal arts and sciences in many programs that track to uh, transfer institutions and even at that a two plus two is less than a one to four. So and then we also have our career in technical education where students can either get that degree or get that high wage earning certificate and exit right to the workforce. So uh, if you ever need me to speak anywhere, I'm <laughs> Uh, the way we get to work together uh, is that we all have good information. <laughs> Manuel, can you give us a witness? <laughs> I'm a witness. Are you quiet? And she will speak. <laughs> I can 
pretty much promise you that. <laughs> One point, please. I don't want to go any further. <laughs> please. Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Meekie, the first point you made about, and it's a really important one about uh, getting along with, you know, do you always have to vote lockstep in your party? And no, we don't. And you vote for what's in the best interest of your district. That's what we take our vote uh, for and representing. And, and it's, uh, I, you know, there's many examples. I just you know, will give you one uh, where Senator Chamberlain and I, uh, Representative Fisher and Representative Runbeck, worked very closely on some legislation that was actually kind of bucked by some of the people in our Democratic caucus on uh, the implementation for the court order on uh, the White Bear Lake, uh, putting in some bans, some restrictions before the appeal went through. Uh, I remember Peter taking some heat on the floor, and uh, you know, I guess he was working with uh, the other side. Well, so what? It was the it was the right thing to do, and yeah, that was an example. And there's not time to go through others, but I um, think it's so important that we get along, and I pledge I'll do my best to continue in that spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at, We'll just have a couple of concluding remarks, and uh, how about uh, Representative Zhang? And then, if, if you'd like, we'd like to just take a picture. It's not used for partisan purposes or anything, but we just, you know, share that that we had a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so uh, thank you all so much for taking the time on a Saturday uh, to join us to, to share with us your concerns. Um, one thing I try to tell. Uh, resident is that you know election is over but that doesn't mean our problems are over it doesn't mean that the concerns of the communities are over we need to hear your voices uh, you coming to testify down at the state capitol means more than what I or Peter or uh, Senator Wiegand can say your stories matter more than any fiery speech I can try to get <laughs> so, uh, we, we need your voices and we want to encourage you to participate and be part of the process. Okay. Uh, just want to say thank you to everybody for being here today. Very much appreciate hearing the input. One of the things I'd like to mention out there is that if you want to get a hold of me, uh, first of all is uh, if you'd like to make a point with my LA is back here today, you know, make sure to connect with Spencer uh, and you know, particularly for the issues that are out there, uh, you can get your name and number and I'll get you on my schedule. Uh, I don't always meet people out of my office. Sometimes it's easier to meet out here in the district as you can spend myself and help coordinate that to be out here. Uh, if there are other issues, we're more than happy to come out and meet, meet you out here in the district. I uh, want to give you my cell phone number so if things come up. Uh, I've had people text me. I've had people call me. I'm not always able to pick up when I first, when it comes in, so don't be afraid to leave voicemail. Uh, my, my cell phone number that comes into this phone that's right here is 651. 307-1625. Everybody right now. Yeah. 651-307-1625. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone. You're our boss, and we take that very seriously. Uh, my cell phone, 651-70283. Of course, you can get us you know, our emails as well, but yeah, we, we are very willing to come and follow up. Uh, we have regular updates that we do as well. Nancy puts that out. So if you're not on our newsletter, uh, please let us know, and we'd be happy yeah. to and, do whatever we can. And I'm new, and so my phone is not actually in the office yet. Uh, but you can email me uh, to dot John and at uh, State Minnesota. At Hostop. At yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so and keep. We'll have our contact info. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a size machine. Yes, sir. Contact. Yeah, we can contact folks.